I'm putting up with all the technical difficulties, everyone. I see we have a packed house tonight. Thank you. This afternoon. Um, Wanda Nenebush is our moderator today, and she's going to present whatever happens next. Thank you all. Thank you all. So thanks everyone for coming in on for noon and this beautiful food that's been prepared and thanks Paul for the stressful teching. Um, for the people standing at the back, there is some tiny bit of space on the floor up here. If you want to sit down, you can, if you don't mind being right in our knees. Um, but yes, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Wanda Nanabush. I'm going to just do a little introduction to your panel today. And hopefully everyone was there for the performances last night because they were amazing. It was a really well put together program. Um, to, first to my left we have, well, first we have Francisco, and he is going to be translating for Guadalupe Neves, right to his right. Um, she is a multimedia artist and performer with a background in philosophy and arts. She has presented her work in festivals in Mexico, Chile, Finland, Japan, Italy, France, Uruguay, and Argentina. As an organizer, uh, she organized international performance festivals, including In Transit, uh, in the Japanese-Argentine Performance Exchange, and Mutaciones, Tribute to Portillos. <laughs> um, so that's Guadalupe. And next to her is Paul Hurley, and, um, from uh, the UK. Uh, he's a UK-based artist working primarily in live performance with occasional other solo and collaborative projects. He's recently been exploring the possibilities of performance in absentia through um, in, in, in installation, which is an awesome word, through installation work and con connection time, a project exploring live online performance documentation. He has performed in galleries, theaters, public spaces in Europe, North America, and Asia. He's had his work published internationally, and in 2009 he was awarded a PhD from the University of Bristol for a practice-based project undertaken with Arnolfini Gallery, and it was supported by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Um, you can read it online, it's actually really interesting, I'm sort of taking a crack at it. Um, and Maria Hupfield, yay, yay. <laughs> <laughs> grew up on the shores of Georgian Bay, Canada, and currently lives in New York. Um, she was born in 1975. She's an Anishinaabe Kwe, a member of Wasaksing First Nation, which is just an island in, near Georgian Bay. She holds an MFA in sculpture from York University. Her practice is interdisciplinary and grounded in a combination of both indigenous and Western art practices. She is the current artist in residence at Open Studio at the Museum of Art and Design in New York. So that's your esteemed panel. Um, I kind of want to get past these bios because I really, you know, it's always like you can read them later. It doesn't really tell you enough about a person. Um, so I kind of wanted to start with a bit more of a personal kind of look at um, our panel. And my first question is, going down the line, starting with Guadalupe, is um, what, where were you born and how does... Um, the uh, space of your childhood or an experience in your childhood. Uh, tell us a little bit of a story that relates to your practice now. I was born in a little town in, in Argentina and when I was seven years old I went to Buenos Aires. Um, I, I don't know if uh, childhood had to do with my actual performance. I think that all my life has to do with my actual performance. Yeah. Not especially childhood. Yeah, there's no memory, I mean. There's no memory that you have that ever came out yes, of Yes, I have a lot of memories, but uh, they are uh, one part of my history, not, not the, the essence of the, of the history at all because I am a quick lunch old <laughs> now. <laughs> so childhood is far, far long away from from my present, I think. Okay. Uh, so when I talk about memories, uh, I I don't I, I'm not talking about memories from uh, that has to do with childhood special. Um, but uh, in a way uh, 
not only in, in childhood, but also now, there are some actions that are very important for me. Uh, for example, to read is very important for me. It was very important in childhood. Uh, so words is, are part of my present and are part of my body. And, and I think that it has to do with, with the work I, I am trying to do now. Yeah, I was born in the south of England, in a kind of small town, kind of in the countryside, and uh, spent a lot of time in the countryside as a child, and, um, and then at 18, moved away to university and sort of lived in a succession of kind of larger and larger cities, um, not big cities yet, but quite big cities. And, um, um, but then, but my my family, or my parents, were from um, the east end of London, so I kind of spent some of my childhood in London as well. So I had this kind of, yeah, kind of split experience, I suppose, of being in the country but not being from the country, um, and likewise with the city and having these relationships. But kind of the rural environment is still kind of quite important to me, and kind of inspiring to me, even though I do most of my work in urban environments. Um, so I think, I've not really thought about it until now, but yeah, that, I think there's probably a relationship there that comes through in my art practice. Um, Thank you. Maria? Um, so I, well I grew up between two reserves in central Ontario, but from here we call it northern Ontario. Um, and it was very rural, so it really was a bush. My dad has a boat building business now um, called Lost in the Woods Boat Works, and it really is like that. For my childhood we had an outhouse for a good part of that early stage of my life. Um, yeah, and grew up by the water and then lived in Toronto here for almost on and off for 10 years during my undergrad and my masters and then moved to Vancouver on the west coast. And I think that was interesting because I had never really thought about, even though he, there I was in my own country, that on the west coast I felt like a guest in someone else's territory because of the Coast Salish people and being from the woodlands. And now being in Brooklyn, I guess, the thing that I always sort of think about is that um, like just sort of who I am is in my bones. It's like in my, you know, it's something I carry with me wherever I go. So, yeah, I find I think a lot about um, place and what makes a place and how is that place a little bit different and how do you get to know a place and sitting there and, um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I also want to mention that uh, the audience can ask questions all the way through. So if you just raise your hand, I'll keep looking and uh, you can interject at any point. Don't feel like you're interrupting or if you want to continue a line of thought, um, that's perfectly all right. Just raise your hand and I'll get to you. All right. Um, at this point, are there is there any continuance of this part question from the crowd? No. Okay. Um, I was thinking about your work last night in terms of, um, because today we're dealing with um, the idea of materials um, in performance. And um, obviously all three of you um, uh, use amazing materials. They're quite a wonderful aspect of your work. And um, I think work that deals with materials often strikes me as painterly or building images um, throughout the work. And um, for uh, Guadalupe, I was thinking that um, you, um, in, a, in a way, you were trying to build an image of time in your work. And I was wondering if you could give, give a bit more about, about that aspect of your performance last night. Well, it's very difficult. <laughs> Every time. OK, it's all right. Um, it, it's just an image that has to do with try to evocate and try to make uh, audience to evocate some feelings and some sensations. 
uh, special sensations mm. that have to do with the special moments or not. So uh, perhaps it has to do with uh, a point in a, in a time, and perhaps it has to do with a long time mm. or a long process in your life. Uh, so uh, the image or the, the, the materials also have to do with another uh, kind of uh, fears, how do you say? Yes, yes. fears. That has to do with, like, with time too, like illness, like death, mm -hmm. that are fears of all of us, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Um, and I, I like to just to take with daily materials, and I always use materials that are very symbolic to me. paper towel dress and the eye yeah. drips and yeah um, yes I wondered how you use words as materials yes I, I you wonder why que como usas las palabras como material because I think that uh, words uh, has the same power of evocating mm. sensations than other other <coughs> materials there are other materials also. Um, and, and materials have uh, a sound, have a, a surface, have a color. And I think that words have surface, sounds, and reason also. So they are a very important material for me. And as I said before, uh, um, they are part of my daily life. I work with materials, with them, every day. I communicate with others by words. And I like how words have a powerful of meaning completely different things, but at the first, at, at the same time, they say the same thing uh, for each of us. Is it right? Can I explain? Yes. Yeah? I just have a quick question. I was wondering what was inside actual IV, like the liquid material, like what was it? So she's asking what was inside the IV, the actual liquid. Uh, no, only temper. Temper? Temper. Water. Water. Yeah. Water color. Water color. Yeah. And there was, um, yeah, it makes you think of, of, of water, which is kind of like a nourishment type thing, but also the color of blood is actually blue. Like it had all these different kinds of connotations, depending on, I guess, what your personal experience is. But what was it for you? Well, I, I didn't want to talk about blood directly. Yeah. Yeah. It was so, so... Too heavy. Yes. Too much meaning. Too, too, too symbolic for me. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I, I wanted to, to, to look for someone else that has to do with, with uh, beauty in an experience of life, you know? Mm -hmm. Not only fear, not only uh, illness. Yeah, combining them together. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from over here. I was no, no, no. Just okay. I was wondering about uh, different certain materials, like materials that are closer to you, like uh, there, are, there are something like significant in your life, or maybe from the past, like a paper toy, or like your, a cloth from your mother. How does that change when you're doing your as you're conducting your journey, your performance? Que cuando usas algún algún material que tiene algún alguna significancia especial para ti como algo algo de tu niñez o algo que sea tuyo de ti que cómo cambia el usar materiales que sean que tengan una conexión personal a materiales de, de todos los días. Ah, uh, well, yes, I, I try to to work with with materials that has to do with me, but also I I I look for materials that are important for everybody that are common for everybody. 
And because I, I don't want to talk only about it. I want to connect with, with others in those things that has to do with the others, with, with both, uh, not only me, but also every people that has a special remembering. Or it's an entry point into yeah. your performance, too, for us, if we have a connection to that particular material. Yeah. I'd like uh, Maria to answer this question as well. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the last question in terms of, um, yeah, how do you move the material from your personal private space and how does it change when you put it in a performance space? Um, well, I, I'm really interested in sort of things of the everyday and just stuff that's around us in the world. And so, um, with the materials and I'm just sort of playing with them and um, I guess if I'm using the duct tape that I'm basically drawing in real space, right? Or if I'm using the blanket, I'm sculpting and creating space around me. Um, so in that way, it's bringing all of these other components that might be drawing, painting, um, sculpture, whatever, print, different cases, uh, and then using my body, right, so in the same way that rather than using paint, I'm using my, my body to activate it. Um, yeah, and I think a lot of my work really does come from, on one level, it's sort of autobiographical, but then, um, but in the performance, in the end, it, it isn't, because I've sort of opened it up into a, to a place where, um, that it, it's more accessible to everyone, right? So. Yeah. Um. Paul, um, when I was watching your performance last night, um, the image that came to mind was an image of, uh, well, both, um, as you said, the, the ruralness, there is some kind of like, kind of harvest feeling going on there, um, but, and also like the joy of community, like activities, um, but it still was an image of precariousness, and um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Um. Yeah, um, I don't know if I can. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there was the sort of literal precarity on the tea string, on the stilettos. Um, and I think with some of the other material, I'm quite interested in that kind of teetering, um, not just physically, but kind of metaphorically or things kind of teetering between the kind of tender and vulnerable. I mean, also some of these objects that I'm using and strategies that I'm using are kind of making me and my body kind of vulnerable. Um, but they kind of teeter between that and a kind of absurdity and the humor and the performance kind of teeters between that as well, I think. Um, so that precarity is kind of not knowing what's going to happen or not knowing, you know, because we don't in performance, it's like, <laughs> yeah, anything could happen. I have an idea of what I think might happen, but, you know, it's absolutely precarious with the situation as to whether that happens or not. Um, in my mind, actually, it's very likely to happen because I have the objects and I have the intention, but within me there's a kind of, I mean actually there's a kind of, there's an anxiety and a kind of, I'm sure other people have this as well coming to performance, a kind of, like in a way I, I sort of equally love and hate performing um, <laughs> and I kind of, like it just, yeah, it's terrifying and it's like, what the fuck am I doing, why am I going to do this? Um, and then, so then that, there's a kind of precarity in that, I think, as well, kind of putting, putting one's self on the line, as it were, um, in a way that's sort of necessary, in some weird way. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if you uh, had something, if you scripted something to a degree that would, like, maybe 
I guess maybe remove as an element of anxiety, but then do you think it would like also remove this other like crucial element and maybe make the performance less valid in some way? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I don't I don't know if it's a question of validity. Um, I was going to say the word authentic then, and then, but then I actually did. Um, <laughs> I no, I, I can't say the dirty word, um, <laughs> but then it's, it's, it's out there already. Um, yeah, but I mean it with, with scripting or with kind of like, that, sometimes I can sort of have varying degrees of like how meticulously I score a performance. Um, and yesterday it was quite meticulous. Um, but there's always like the risk that I'll forget. Like even like before, five, ten minutes before, I was going through the list, like, okay, so this bucket, and then I move to that bucket, and then I've got to carry the stilettos over there. What, and what then, do you score? What if I forget? What do the scores look like? Just a, a list of actions or? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, a list of kind of descriptions of the actions or kind of words, and then often like a drawing, like a plan. Arrows and lines <laughs> saying like bucket or like walk this way. And, so it's like there's a degree of script in this almost. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah usually. Well, thank you for your performance and for coming from so far away. Um, just sort of one one comment first, which is that because you were talking about precarity and absurdity, and uh, the one image that will stay with me is the whole sort of painting of the runway with your head. It was so amazing how physical it was, and like the panting, and like you started out, you know, similar to uh, the skipping performance. You could really feel the effort of the body. So that really, really struck and stayed with me. But um, just, just hearing the word, sorry, just hearing the word authenticity, uh, one thing that I really wanted to hear you perhaps speak to or talk a little bit more about your thought process had to do exactly with this choice of materials. Um, and what I'm referring to is sort of the context of you coming here and the choice of the feathers. And of course, what was interesting was, of course, putting your bells on, right? Which is such a great old expression for dressing up and going out and celebrating. But then, of course, there was this also this interesting sort of parallel, I would assume, and I can't speak as an expert about this, but it, of course, made me think about First Nations dances. So did you think about anything uh, revolving around that? Um. A little in in the preparation for it, um, but those those actions are things that I've used in the past, um, and whether I mean I seemingly kind of have a little sort of knowledge or understanding of traditions here. Um, the feathers, I don't even know where the feathers sort of came from. Um, that's just something I've done once or twice before, um, and partly just kind of for the visual image. Um, and the bells have a kind of, I mean, for me, the bells, I think I started using using bells, and then various, a couple of, one particular friend sort of like pointed out the associations with um, a form called Morris dancing, which is like a traditional English folk dance. Um, and actually, I didn't think of that, but where I grew up down in Dorset, um, there's like a big folk festival every year that's been running for like 30 years. And, and so this one weekend of the year, the whole town gets invaded by Morris dancers, which are kind of usually single sex teams. And um, it's kind of quite ritualistic and a bit kind of pagan. And they sort of wear hats with flowers on. And some of the dancers are with handkerchiefs. Um, some of them with big sticks, they kind of bang the sticks and bash the sticks together. And uh, so I think this was kind of in my subconscious and then I started using bells and then a friend pointed it out. Um, 
And then in the last couple of months, I've actually started Morris dancing, joined a Morris dancing team, <laughs> and, and gone against sort of that kind of like the inner rebellion against that form, having grown up around it. Around it. Like in, in Britain, it is kind of it has a sort of common ridicule to it. Uh, it's quite odd, um, but it's just generally kind of like non-dancers, uh, just kind of men who go and dance and then go and drink beer after. Um, so where, I can't remember where, where, where I was going with that, or where? Oh, the bells. The bells and the dance, yeah. So I, so I was thinking while I was here, yeah, that there are kind of obvious, probable kind of connections with First Nations traditions here. Um, but there are probably, you know, it's connections with bells on feet dancing across cultures, I imagine. Um, Connections, but it doesn't make them close. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, it's funny. Connections, but not, yeah. Yeah, and it's so funny going to yeah. different places and then, and kind of before one gets there, one kind of doesn't quite understand really kind of local connotations or things that like totally skew what might be an otherwise kind of neutral material or neutral object. And that can be really interesting. I have a, a fairly basic question about the relationship between uh, action and material and whether, um, you know, sometimes I, it, the material comes first and you, and you kind of play with it and you mess around with it and then something comes out of that, but sometimes it works the other way, you're like combing through different places for the right material to do the right thing for you. Um, I just wondered about that relationship in your own practice and then we'll start with Maria. Uh, yeah, I think in my in my practice, it's the materials first. That sort of, and maybe that's coming from the sculpture background and painting background. Just add this one instead because that one doesn't seem to work very well. So I'll I'll just see objects that I that I really like. For example, I have this one pair of really gorgeous long red gloves that I just love. I just saw them in the fashion district. I'm like, I need these gloves. And I go to another store and I see this long red fringe and I'm like, oh my god, this is great. And I'm in the studio and I'm like, these two need to get together. And when I wear those gloves, it's a moment for me because you know I'm five foot nine and you know for a woman growing up being five foot nine was very awkward and whatnot. So when I wear those gloves, I can embody the feminine, right? Like I can be like suddenly I can shake your hand and it's the most amazing gesture. So <laughs> Um, that's how it is with materials for me. Like I'm very much, I love glitter. I love these things and I play with them and work with them and develop a vocabulary, right? Um, yeah. So I think last night for fixed time, that was the first time where those materials were all materials that I've used before. I've used the jingles before, before they were on my feet as boots, felt boots. So the idea that I could sneak up, you couldn't hear me coming, the boots don't make noise, but the jingles are what makes the noise. So for last night, I kept thinking, well, I really want to embody sound and dance, but I'm not a dancer <coughs> and I'm not a musician, so this was a way for me to physically like embody that. Um, but also as an artist, I make things with my hands. So I was like, well, I don't, you know, the feet were one thing, but now, with my hands, it's like, yeah, as I'm making, it just felt like a more, an evolution of that. So things sort of grow from there. And you know, once you have those gloves on, you know, you can't really help yourself with what you do. Anything's possible. Anything's possible. Yeah. So you can just put it out. I mean, you can throw, throw a ball at someone and they can get all the candy. You can pop them. Out. So. Yeah, <laughs> Paul? Um. Yeah, for me, some of the some of the objects, materials, kind of came first. Um, often, or for me, kind of actions come out of kind of drawing and imagining them, and then thinking, right, I need to get find that object or that material. Um, occasional things are kind of you know just see something in a shop or. I, think I need to use that. Mm -hmm. 
just in terms of sticking your head in a bucket, um, like, because you could have stuck anything in a bucket, right? To, to paint the paper, so why, you know what I mean? Like, the, where does that impetus to stick your head in there come from? And use your hair as the brush, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know, I guess for me, like, the body is kind of centrally important as a, it's a little of a cliche, but kind of as an object or as a material as well. Um, and it's a kind of, yeah, it's a physical object of kind of communication in that process of making a performance with other objects um, and materials. So it was kind of, I think that was just kind of experimenting with. A while ago I was thinking, what can I do with, what else can I do with paint and a bucket? And well, I can just put my head in it. I think I put my head in buckets of water before and then, and in like an empty bucket and then thought, oh, what, what happens if I put it in a bucket of paint and oh, I can paint with my head. Yeah. But actually doing that last night, I was thinking last night, I'd, I wanted to kind of explore that as a way of painting, as a way of making paintings in the studio. <coughs> um, yeah, okay. uh, Guadalupe? Uh, well, it depends on the work too, but in this special work, it began with uh, a sensation, a body sensation. It's right, or it's corporal sensation. And then when I, I, I didn't want it to work with a, an action, but with sensation of body. And then materials came uh, in the second part of the work because uh, I only walk, uh, thought about just being in a place or a walk or something like that, but in, but actually nothing. Um, so then I I want I remember some sensations uh, I had when I was just uh, waiting for something while looking for uh, a, a, my mother who was in. So I always saw the the. The, the water dripping in the intravenous and that sensation was very strong for me so I wanted to use it and the other material which is that are very important in, in this work are uh, words and it ha I wanted to make audience to have some physical sensations also or sensations that had to do with their body uh, in this case. Yeah, even when you drop the, the bowls, like the, yeah, it's, it's it very the jarring. Last, it was the last uh, material that appeared, but it had to do with a, with a, with a problem, because uh, the, uh, Francisco told me there was a problem in the gallery, so I was looking for something that uh, the drop uh, uh, receive uh, to receive the, the dropping, and I like them because I when I, I found the, the the balls of metal I I began to work with it with them and I really like them and so I decided to use and when I came they they told me that they have resolved the problem but they wanted to to use them <laughs> also yeah. anyway. anyway. Uh, we have a question back here. Um, speaking of sensations, I was just wondering what are these sensations that you're speaking of? How would you describe these sensations, particularly in reference to the fact that you use words in your work? And if there's like a relation between the two? So he's asking um, about sensation and <coughs> the use of words and what's the relationship between the sensations that you're working with and the words. Um, I in Castellano. Sí. Yeah, I need to translate. Yeah. Um, I think that our body 
eh, siente y piensa más allá de nuestra mente. And I think the body thinks and feels. No, you can use it, just don't talk no, no, so much at the same time. Okay. ¿Qué <laughs> Um, I think that there's a, a, a very specific relationship between words and sensations and uh, sometimes specific words have um, they, they have the ability to call up specific sensations you know that the body has a memory and that things like words have the, the ability to tra trigger very specific um, sensations <coughs> in the body mm. At the back? Uh, yeah. Uh, I'd like to do a question to the involved, you know, like, uh, since we're talking a lot, but you know, because I've been noticing that um, there's been a lot of performances that are bringing a lot of cliches, like uh, many festivals and venues and whatever, on the using of materials, for example. And I would like to know um, how the chronology of the using of a certain object in in the discipline of performance art influence your choice on using some kind of objects and creating some kind of action. <laughs> so the chronology of objects being used in performance art and how does that influence your choice and choices in your own work? How do you avoid being a cliche? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I guess um, just thinking about like, for me, it really goes back to someone like Nick Cage who was using just, you know, basic everyday objects that would make sound. And, and so for me, it's thinking of how can I be present in the moment? Like, how can I be, um, the object is secondary. It's like, even though it might be where I start from, it, because it becomes the excuse to interact with people. So it's almost like, Um, and maybe also because I was really shy when I was young, and so it's easy for me when I'm performing, I'm not a persona, I'm just me doing things that I would do normally. So when I came to performance, it was sort of a gradual evolution where I realized it wasn't, when I was making the thing, it wasn't the final product, it was the making, that was the work. And so those are things that I'm, that's sort of how I approach. Where I was coming from. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I kind of quite, well, not consciously, but I do kind of awarely use cliched objects and materials. Um, and I'm kind of aware of a, you know, certain kind of traditions that I'm coming out of or that that are just kind of present and that I'm aware of. And on one level, I'm kind of interested in playing with those and, you know, what happens if we take endurance and metal buckets and paint? Um, and what, what else can we do with those other than what might be expected? Um, and I think perhaps, I don't know what the dynamic is, in terms of hand gestures, but kind of simultaneously they're kind of as much as materials are important, like the specificity of the materials isn't the most important thing. To perhaps what Maria was something you said kind of resonated with me in terms of that, that it's sort of sometimes I just use those kind of cliched objects because they're there and because everyone kind of knows them and Everyone appreciates a metal bucket, or and it's kind of like the, the work kind of happens, goes beyond that, or goes through that in some way. I just want to, I just would like to add that uh, 
That's a really good question. Um, and also in performances that it can change, right? So for me, when I'm marking up the space with tape and then I'm marking up the space physically with the surveyor's tape, um, showing the interconnectedness of things, it's often determined by the site. So if there's poles and beams, I can really play with that and crawl through things and move through things. But if you come out and people are sitting, then it, I mean, Last night, I feel like the dynamic of the group ended up being that it was, it became more about moving through the people with that line in a way, and that action can change, and I have to adapt to it. So that's also um, what keeps me engaged with that action, is that simple tape is, and also reducing it, like maybe at one time I had two colors of tape, right? And then, so I think I have this archive of, of things, and then depending on how things are going, I'll, I'm just trying to be present in that moment to respond to what's happening, you know. I love that there might be a couple with their arms and I can wrap around those arms, like I think about that in that moment, um, and then I move to something else. So I, it's perhaps a bit selfish, too, on my part. I have to answer. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Uh, um, I was thinking that as I'm from Argentina, and it is so far, far away from everywhere, uh, we don't have that problem. <laughs> you know? Because uh, we have a sort of innocence of everything that is happening. Um, Otherwise, uh, on the other hand, there are so many good artists that are doing uh, art now that it's a risk you have all the time just to do the same of the other in another country or in another city. So I, I, I saw some actions twice or three times or four times, but as the context was completely different in each time. For me, they weren't uh, uh, a cliche. If they apported, apported? Yeah, if they, they gave me, they gave me something in each case. But, I don't know. <laughs> can, I, can I say something as yeah. myself? It's a lack of this. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the, the only the only thing I, I, I wanted to add, as myself, uh, is that it, the, the thing to, to remember too is sort of the specificity of the body because you like you know one kind of body uh, working with tape or one kind of body uh, you know I don't know skipping rope will not be the same thing as you know a very different kind of body of a different gender of a different ability uh, of a different cultural background you know and that even even the same body doing the same action you know when they're 18 and when they're 55 you know and that might be the the, the thing actually this is something that, that that came out of a conversation that I had with Margaret a couple of years ago the realization that there is there are there are similarities and there are histories but that the action is really at, at the intersection of, of the moment and, and what the body is doing at that time. I was thinking that too in terms of, I wonder if it's almost a curator's problem more than a performer's problem because, um, because we see so much work all the time that we start seeing work the same, everything starts looking similar and 
but it also makes you attend to the differences of each moment that you see something because because you've seen it a million times when it's different you really pay attention but um, if you're a performer that doesn't look at a lot of performance art which happens um, then it might not even be an issue for you in a way I don't know um, we've got some comments at the back here and in a way it's kind of like a process I mean um, no really chronological order, you never really know where it's going to go. Kind of like a painter, like they give themselves the materials to use, but say if that paint dries up too fast, and it like constantly takes to rethink your actions. And like uh, with Maria's case, like when she's moving through um, the space, she kind of is moving through, I'm, I'm not implementing that you're thinking, but uh, kind of like you're kind of, you know, couples together, so you find them together. When you're like thinking of a painting and you're kind of like seeing how the colors match, it's kind of like that's how I kind of think of it in a way. Um, like performance arts all, like it's just another way of an artistic practice and a process and you're seeing that um, that individual like go through that process. Through a painting you don't actually get to see that but it's there and that's a physical object that's there at the end whereas in the space as like a performance artist um, what they leave behind is the, the, the paint, I mean the, the painting I guess in a way. I don't know if you agree. So, yeah, so it, well, what, yeah. I was also going to say that it's also something I think about in its entirety as well because sometimes you come to a performance if it's an endurance piece or any number of things maybe the, the glowing hula hoop wasn't for me at first but by the end the randomness of it hitting people was a really exciting that was an exciting performance in the end for me um, so perhaps initially an action might not catch hold, but if it, if you stay through to the end, sometimes things happen. And so maybe tape seems different after you hear jingles, right? Or maybe marking through space seems different after you look at a woodland style painting where everything's outlined in black and suddenly here's someone physically moving through the space with green tape and, you know, feeling like I'm not bound to a rigorous line form drawing, you know? so. There's many points of entries, and so I think that's also something, um, yeah. I mean, I really love gold high heels. I wish I could. I wish I could wear them. <laughs> so, yeah. Paul, do you want to comment? Yeah, no, just, I was just thinking then about, um, in relation to painting, that we have a strange or a peculiar situation in performance as a, as a kind of form. Um, that we're not restricted to materials or objects and actually kind of most painters are generally restricted to paint um, and most sculptors are kind of generally restricted to a few kind of key materials and we can just pick whatever whatever we want um, from you know so it's a kind of so, so that's why we you know painters don't I don't know I'm not a painter but I I imagine they don't worry about the cliche of using paint um, <laughs> or using like red because um, it's quite restrictive to like painting trees again. <laughs> what? Yeah, there, but that, there, that, yeah. there is that problem with painting is the representation, but yeah. yeah. Do you want to comment, Guadalupe? No, it's okay. <laughs> Um, Maria, I was, um, I think you're, yeah, I'll come to you in one sec. Um, I uh, was thinking about um, what you evoked wonder in your performance for me, partly in how you walk, marked out the space um, and played with the audience, and also in terms of your choice of materials, like your big bear mask, just the choice of material for making that. You could have chose any other kind of material, so why that one? The flag waving. Um, you know, the, the, the beautiful holographic <laughs> dust, like when you blew it, it was just, you know, so I wonder if you can speak to that a little. If you were trying to, what kinds of emotions you're trying to evoke and if that wonder is one of them. Well, I, I don't, well, thank you. I don't know if I was necessarily going for, to create an emotion in that way. Um, I was looking at actions I've been using, that I've been working through in a number of, of ways. And last night was the first time where I spoke. I usually don't speak when I perform. And so I was wanting to approach it from this idea of oral tradition um, and thinking about how um, 
the piece was called Fixed Time, and how they say once a performance happened, or, you know, so I said, once a performance happened, that the moment is gone, it's fixed in time. And I'm like, but if you're from an oral tradition, it's almost like time isn't linear where it's always going. You can hear the same story 50 times, and every time it's the exact same story, but you see it differently because you've changed. So I was thinking a lot about these sorts of ideas. Um, and wanting to draw upon a few strategies that were all that I was researching around oral tradition. So that's you know like how do you you know coming in, announcing yourself, greeting people, making them you know um, comfortable. So things like that, and even using the the words. So I don't know how I feel about using you know saying now it ends. See, I'm still absorbing that myself. But in the spotlight too, when I saw that space and it was brought up, what about the spotlight? We thought the spotlight will follow me. So I think there's things that the performance really came together in this, um, that night. And the spotlight did change how I usually am interacting in a, in a different way. I had many more tokens to give out. Um, but yeah, so I think it was very specific even though I don't know if that answers your question, but the silver and the wonder. But. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. I mean, it's as much your performance as mine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we had a comment from over here. Can you stand and uh, yeah, kind of talk loud? And project. Oh. Uh, it's a question for Maria, really, and it, and it maybe is harking back to the cliche or this kind of anxiety around um, certain cultural symbols, but I know that part of what you are doing is kind of reworking symbols that are associated with tourism, for instance, and you're trying to kind of, you know, work away from those. Yeah. So that does seem to be a part of what you're very consciously thinking through. So the question is, um, tourism, tourism symbols, and how are you interacting with those or working away from them? Yeah, I think I, I do deal with iconic symbols like a bear head and a I Love New York t-shirt. Um, and really what, I think living in Canada and having um, First, Nation, First Nation ancestry, it's really, and for me to move to Brooklyn is a way to kind of get away from, because when I lived here it was always the point of entry was, how is this native? So I kind of felt like if I stick a feather in anything, we can talk about being native, right? In my head. Um, and I didn't want to just have those conversations. So it's sort of an opening up that, the I Love New York t-shirt's no different for me than, you know, I don't, there's basically two stereotypes for indigenous women. One is like the squaw, the beast of burden, or the Indian princess. And in there, where do you relate? Like no one can relate to that, you know, unless it's Halloween. Um, so that allows me to kind of open up and deal with other, maybe cliche things, maybe not what you're talking about, but, um, but the teddy bear head and deal with get through some of that in a broader, yeah. Are there other questions from the audience at the very back? I would like to, to, to ask all of us to answer again to this question that I find enormously generous. Mm -hmm. Because we approach it with fear and then what we consider to be connotations like cliche, worn out signs, or materials, or, or someone even said, we shouldn't question the uniqueness of, of someone's presence. Yes, no one does this. But I think there is a, an innocent, a, a kind of implicit suggestion that when you work with material, and if you're aware, and no one is saying that we have to be aware, we must be aware, but we might be, and it's always good to be aware, then how do you contextualize your work with respect to, you know, this is a, a whole art history, right? and I'm not just in terms of performance art. You know, Velasquez could be as well using a, a, a ribbon too. So how do you, do you participate and how do you reflect on, on this, you know, aesthetical and historical and ethical and paradigm and how you maintain a kind of inner dialogue with all these artists that have approached the same material and then what this material is holding paradigmatically because there is a connection between how you approach it and how another artist artists lived in the 18th century. But this, this sign actually carries mental content that is good. And, and by the way, it has a great connection to the first topic of 
of these uh, daily talks that I missed, which was networking. You know, it's a kind of visual solidarity, but it only starts the visual solidarity. We, we agree to use the same like pile of flour. But what is that the flower stands for? What is that it gives? What kind of mental dynamic intention? What kind of value? Because network is so much about sharing certain sets of values and not just sharing, but turning them into a problem, into a conflict, into something that has to be discussed again and again and again, and we have to fight over and agree and know each other and do everything that, that life is about. So again, thank you for the question. And I think. Uh, I'll do my best. Um, so I think what we're talking about, again, is the aesthetic history of an object, the historical, social history of an object, um, how the object relates people to other people, how an object creates a shared community in terms of what that object means, um, and then again, how those objects have been used uh, art historically by other artists. So. Let's do it by object to make this easier for each of you to answer. Um, so, Maria, do you want to? Uh, I'm not going to start with you. Actually, I'll start with Guadalupe. Let's start with the flower, the image of the flower, or the paper towel dress. Yeah. Well, um, bueno, esto, el vestido y la flor tuvo que ver con. Antes que nada, yo quería comentar algo sobre lo que había dicho ella. But before. Uh, before before anything, I would like to comment on something that uh, she said. Um, no, cuando ella dice historia del arte, está hablando quizás de una historia del arte particular que cada artista arma. When you, when she says uh, art history, um, she might be talking about a very particular kind of art history that an, that an artist assembles. Porque creo que un artista tiene sus propios referentes y su propia historia y algo que uno va comprendiendo con el tiempo es que la historia del arte. So, in, in, specifically in the case of the flower, there is uh, a very particular history with the image of Ophelia in art history. Yeah, Ophelia and Ophelios. And, and, and the Ophelios. Yeah. Not just Ophelia, but Ophelio. Now, Now. we... Um, eh, pero también tiene que ver con mi historia particular como performer. But it also has to do with my particular history as a performer. Porque comencé en un grupo <coughs> feminista de performance que éramos cinco mujeres. Because I started in a feminist performance group and we were five women. Yeah. And we work with the flower as a very important uh, material in that moment. Uh, of a cliché of to be feminine, <laughs> you know. Um, I don't know it's, it's, if it's, I don't want to say it. <laughs> <Okay>. Yeah? <laughs> um, um, Puff. You're speaking oh. of, pardon me, uh, you were speaking of in terms of, you know, what, making your own history, in terms of references to your history and artists making their own form of history, but how would you tie that into philosophy, because you're also a philosopher, and how do you borrow from that field, or if you do at all? So she's talking about a personal art history, but then also she's a philosopher, so how does she borrow from that tradition in her work? Well, I um, uh, enseño también historia del arte. <laughs> I teach, I also teach art history. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe in anything. I think that's a, that's a kind of position, a, philosopher, a philosophical position, just to be criticized with all you study and with all you know, you know? Um, that's the first thing I, I, I say to my pupils. Uh, this is the, um, how you say, uh, official history, and now you have to uh, think about them, to, to know about the quali what is the context of the official history and what are the, the power that is behind the uh, history and what are the I ideological situation in each case, yes. 
that make you study now this kind of art <coughs> and before another kind of, 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 of art and those things. Entonces, uh, me parece que tiene que ver con la filosofía en el sentido de que eh, la filosofía para mí es una posición de eh, ser lo suficientemente independiente mentalmente. So it, it has to do with philosophy for me in the sense that for me philosophy has to do with a kind of independence and independence of the mind. Yeah, uh, to be conscious of what is our position in in our world, the world that we have to live in, uh, because it's the only world. Um, y tener una cierta situación de resistencia frente al poder. And creating a, a situation of resistance in the face of power. Uh, with our minds, especially. Yeah. Um, Paul, if you want to answer the question, and I'm thinking specifically about your the dirt. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of lost, but um, <laughs> um, the, the so the so yeah, back to the first question yeah, around the historical, question. aesthetic, kind of history of an object, its relationship to other artists having used it before. Um, yeah, and then how do you negotiate all those things in your use of it? I, I think I just do it. <laughs> um, yeah. Have you seen dirt used in other performances that relates to your own work? Um, not directly, really. I mean, I mean, I've seen dirt used in loads of performances, um, but then I've seen dirt, you know, like in the garden. It feels like it's kind of, <laughs> like it's not, it's not just related to certain art histories or certain <laughs> like that's not like uh, like art histories aren't my main frame of reference. At all um, in most of my life, um, I've got far stronger frames of reference before those. Actually, um, much as I have studied art history, I'm aware of art histories, and I'm aware of kind of contemporary practice of my peers and of other stuff. Um, you know, it doesn't bother me too much. That's a good point, um, Maria. I was wondering if you could talk about that, maybe in terms of duct tape. <laughs> Um, I, I guess uh, in terms of, I don't know how much I want to talk about the history of performance. I mean, I guess that's the thing that I feel like um, that's really exciting for me about being here is that I'm aware of how how, how performance it, um, in art history is seen as very young, like how at one time, how crazy it was that I'm gonna make something that I can't sell, I'm gonna use my body, here I am, I'm present, and how that was like this so radical idea. Um, and how now to do something sensational isn't, you know, getting naked isn't so, um, you know, as it was back then. But, but then looking at another idea of, as someone who's also comes from this other tradition of indigenous and ceremony and culture that performance is ancient, right? Like it's 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 not, I'm kind of like, in terms of art history, art history is catching up with what indigenous peoples have been doing all along. And, and as people we've been, if we go back beyond that art history. So um, yeah, that's what I want to say about that. Excellent. We have a question from the back here. I think it's really interesting how we're speaking about like the types of materials that we use in your performance. And as a performance artist, you constantly have to like explain the use of the object. Uh, but like, why is that the case? It's because we're so subconscious. Um, that means of content what you use. Meanwhile, like say in accounting, you know, why would they use a specific big pen or something? Is it more smooth or something? Like, like there's a history to that as well. But I mean, I feel like with performance, I mean, every object has significant uh, meaning for that individual. Person. 
characters and why we have them bar them and all these questions of why and why and like the chronological use of them while you know like Paul was saying how like the like the body is a tool like that like a paint like a brush right but the brush was the us we're just subconscious we're subconsciously that object that's why I'm saying subconscious of our but every art piece has like a performance behind it um, I just want to bring that kind of here just because it's a little frustrating. Yeah. So sometimes you're talking about uh, the way in which performance art is uh, working from a place of subconscious or intuition, or and why um, possibly explaining that may not be the best thing. Um, if I could add, um, that one, yeah. Um, there's always, I don't know, I'd, I'd written earlier about kind of inner something or other, inner symbolism, and um, maybe it'd be interesting to hear that you guys have to sort of think about it as well, but that kind of sort of private process um, that you're kind of talking about, um, all those sort of private decisions as to why an accountant uses their particular pen or drinks from a particular mug or um, you know why we use certain materials or objects and um, for me that's a kind of that's a kind of inner logic and an inner process and a lot of those materials uh, have some kind of inner symbolism that sometimes I can articulate um, to myself. Sometimes I can't. Sometimes I just know that I really like something. Um, sometimes it'll have a function, um, like the shoes sort of have a physical function to the way that I then move. Um, but they're also kind of a, a beautiful, amazing thing. Um, but then, sorry. I mean, also, I might not ask themselves why they use that, you know? Just a yeah. certain, like, yeah, connection. Yeah. But then, you know, some of that sort of need to explain or reflect on those decisions yeah. or those choices um, kind of comes from situations like this. Yeah. Uh, but I have to sort of think, well, why do, why is my art historical reference for using earth that I like to put my feet in? Um, or, you know, so it's a kind of funny, it's an interesting space, this, because it is kind of, certainly for me, a kind of an unknown space of having to kind of question or think on these questions. And is it, isn't it true also that the relationship to an object can be discovered through the performance itself, right? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily in events? Mm -hmm. It is true that, that sometimes there are some objects that you work with because you really love them. And you love the color, and you love the sound of the objects without symbolism, just because it's experience, a particular experience for you. Yeah. Oh, Maria, do you want to... Do you want to answer that first? Yeah. Well, I, I was just going to say that even something like the jingle, like the jingle itself, it's it's not a bell, it doesn't have a knocker, so it needs each other to make the noise. And I think that's enough for the jingle and the sound. But knowing also, oh, the jingle is also a very contemporary object that's also used on on a traditional dress. I mean, I don't think that's necessarily that people have to know that that's maybe where I first encountered the jingle on the body, right? Um, and then, but, yeah, I think that those materials that are sort of just drawing those materials that are around, that um, even the survival blankets that I'm using, those mylar blankets, being in the United States and trying to get them in Canada, where I grew up in the snow belt, every survival kit has one because it can save your life. It will stop you from freezing to death. 
But in the United States, they're hard to find. People use them, they're like, oh, you mean the marathon blankets that runners wear to keep them warm after the marathon. So that context changes it. Um, but it's, yeah, so to open that up, it can become a flag, it can become all these different things. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm really still absorbing last night because I think a lot of those objects took on more of a performing of the object in a way that was a little bit less mobile. So I, I'll think about those things too. I mean, I think now I have ideas for, oh, now I need to do this other thing. So. addressing this to Paul, but I guess I can address this to everyone here. Um, your work mostly is sort of like endurance performance within a mix of shaman rituals, like shaman uh, work. And I was wondering, and you also talk about that life moment, that in-betweenness that you, that you kind of want to achieve between yourself and the audience. But I was wondering, as you are doing these um, endurance performances, do you achieve your kind of like this sort of space, this uh, live moment into yourself, like where you're not really aware of yourself, but you're in a space that, you're in that kind of like nirvana space. And do you achieve that in your performances or do you try to achieve it? Or it's sort of like self-conscious. And I just wondered this with any other artists, um, any performance or any kind of work that you do, do you try to achieve that sort of nirvana? Um, <laughs> Go for Nirvana, yeah, maybe. Nirvana. <laughs> that would be good. Um, no, um, I don't think the kind of complete Nirvana state is achieved um, <laughs> every time. But um, no, there's definitely a kind of you know sort of process of preparation. Um, and of going into a certain kind of state of consciousness um, that, that in a way is and that kind of comes before the performance but then the, the, the performance kind of affects that as well going through that kind of process of actions um, and it's yeah, it's kind of hope, hoping to kind of create an open space in which that can kind of create some space for communication of that state um, between ourselves. If that answers in any concrete way. Actually, I just have one more additional yes. question to add on that. Yes. Do you want? Do you sometimes don't like to bring the audience into your, into your state? Yeah, actually, yeah, yeah, that's a good. Do you, do you bring the audience into your state? Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. Because um, I used to do very kind of intense endurance, kind of closed, concentrated trance-like kind of performance. Um, which can actually be kind of quite exclusionary. Um, and so I find kind of actions that kind of break that a little seem to kind of open up that communication better. And sometimes that's through sort of literal interaction. Um, it's also kind of through looking at people um, and kind of hopefully kind of making people comfortable. Um, and it's also a little through humor as well, through kind of creating that or that space that we have when we laugh at something. We're actually open um, if we're kind of concentrating on how intense and affecting something is. We might be open to it, but we might also like not know how to deal with it. We feel out from it. You're really, you're really good at the eye contact because my view when you were painting with your head was straight between your legs, and so um, I had your your butt here and things hanging and <laughs> dirty feet sort of looking at me, and I had to stare, and it was perfect line straight to your eyes, right while you're, and you actually caught my eyes and looked at me directly, and it was kind of an interesting moment to be look, to connect to somebody from that viewpoint. 
really, it's really like, I love that as well. That, that and, and I, I was thinking as I was doing it, I was like, how can I make a performance where everyone else has this point of view? Um, when, when I'm kind of looking through my my legs and everyone else is up, upside down and then um, just look at it, it's, it's hilarious from, from where I am as well. It sure is. It's actually quite beautiful too. You know, it's kind of a yeah, hilarious, absurd, beautiful image. We have time for one question and Adriana has it at the very back. It seems that it like, swoops quite nicely into my question. I had a question about uh, beginnings. Like the beginning of the moment where you're witness, it was very different for each of you. And uh, Guadalupe had a very clear, for me, you were in the piece when you came into the space, clear. And then the other pieces had a different way, again, with your eye contact, this sort of bringing together. And then, and then Maria is like this kind of melting into witnessing, very gently. And I was curious as to, Particularly, I, I really love shaking in performance from nerves. I find it incredibly beautiful. And so I really appreciated the shaking that I saw. And I, I just wondered if you could speak to the moment before, the moment before you jump. What is that? How is that? Yeah, let's start with Maria. Before we start? Yeah. Like yeah, what space are you in, your headspace, when you just come in to begin? Um, I think, sorry if I wasn't clear, it's like, how do you enter into the performance in the field of the entry, that threshold? Right. Well, I, for, for me, I, I think last night I really liked this idea of sort of creeping up. In fact, if the situation had been different, it would have been nice. I was we were talking about this last night. How different it would it have been if I could have been in the crowd already and just moved, stood up and moved around, right? Um, even the more melting. So, I don't know, I think before, like right before we started, before the first one went on, that back room was a whole different sense of buzzing going on back there. So, for me, yeah, um, it's, I don't know, I, I, it's more a consciousness of I know what I'm going to go out and kind of do. I don't know that there's, um, I think there's more shaking being up here than before the performance. And even, maybe even after the residual of like having performed. I mean, I think James Luna once said, right after the performance is the most loneliest time for a performer. So, <laughs> and I, I, last night too for me was especially pressure because I think there's a lot of amazing people here who's worked in my and like Margaret and lots of people who were in the crowd who I know and whose work I really respect but who haven't seen me perform, including my dad, my brother, who I have to justify why, yeah, this is what I'm working on when I'm in New York, but they don't get to see me. So, yeah, there might have been some of that shaking too. Um, yeah, for me it's kind of, I was just thinking then, it's like a bit like, um, like sitting down for dinner after you've been like, spending the whole day like preparing like a dinner party or something and I can be quite a frantic cook sometimes and be over ambitious and like, get in a complete stress and then um, and then it's like ah, like dinner's ready, everyone sit down like we're beginning now and it's for me that's why that kind of acknowledgement and bringing together of people in that beginning moment or that moment I begin before I begin. Um, it's really important that it's like, you know, we're here now. Um, I I have a My stomach hurts. Yes. <laughs> because, <laughs> 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 all the time. All, all, <laughs> each each time I, I, I perform, I, I really very honest with before because. I think that when you prepare something, uh, you, I, I would say that to perform is something like to tirarte en la pileta. It, it's like throwing yourself into, a, into one of this. Into, 
And sometimes the la pileta está vacía. And, and, and sometimes, you know, that the, there's nothing. Yeah, because uh, you're looking for something, and sometimes you know that the time that uh, you connect is not what you're wo uh, looking for. So uh, it's it's very stress for me the beginning. <laughs> yes. Okay, we, I'm sorry, we don't have any more time for questions. We are um, at the end of our time, but I really want to thank Guadalupe, Paul, and Maria for sharing all of this.